When I first outline a commentary for this presentation, I, I predicted, or I thought I was predicting, that we faced a double whammy. The economy was at the brink in some respects, but of course last week uh, made it obvious to everybody uh, where the problem is centered. The climate problem, and by the way, I was an Air Force weatherman for three and a half years and during World War II, and I've kept up my interest in climatology ever since. Climate warming is a real threat, and it won't show itself effectively for the general population for some years, but we have to become believers in the fact that we have changed the system that supports us. And this is almost the first time the human race has been numerous enough and technologically potential enough to change the parameters of existence. And so this is what we need to talk about. In fact, it's going to be the principal discussion of the next 25 years or so. How much is it going to bear down on us, and how are we going to react? The answer, of course, is we don't know. And this is why we need to anticipate and soften the potential impacts. Now, things 50 years later are very different <laughs> than they were when I began on the conservation field. 50% of the population of the world now is urban, living in cities. I have nothing against living in cities. It's the place to be because there's more interaction there. But the danger is that people get the notion that the city is a self-sufficient environment. It is not. It needs a daily transfusion of water, food, and energy. And somebody has to take the waste away every day. So with so many people in the city, the problem of making people alert to the significance of environmental changes, which we ourselves have created, the system is now backfiring, is not going to be easy. So in a sense, all of us must become missionaries. Not to scare people about things, but to say, look, we have a problem. Let's sit down and talk it out and find an easier transition than otherwise. Now, let me recap very quickly the, the changes in awareness about this dilemma that we're in. It began with the Romantic movement of late 18th century when the Romanticists objected to the mechanization or the mechanistic interpretation of reality provided us by physical sciences. And they were correct. Wordsworth said, we murder to dissect. It was a summing up of the the fact that science was not paying attention to the total picture. So that I, idea systems accumulated all kinds of misinterpretations of reality and made it difficult for us to keep things in proportion. Then the conservation movement, which Audubon led, originated about 100 years ago, actually in 1886, when the sportsmen, especially the fishermen, first complained about the fact that the textile industry 
which had caused the building of so many dams on the big rivers, was eliminating uh, the run of anadromous fish, the salmon, the shad, and so forth. That was the origin of our public awareness of environmental changes of a deleterious nature. And then, of course, as was pointed out in the short introductory film, when ladies began wearing feathers on their hats, there was a general rebellion to that, led by other ladies, by the way. They had the men front for them in organizing early Audubon societies, but it was the women's sensitivity to this problem that created the Audubon movement. And that lasted for about 70 years. That was a way of framing the environmental problem. 1886 to 1962, maybe. Why 62? In 1962, Rachel Carson, a marine biologist working for the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and summering at Woods Hole in the other side of Buzzards Bay here, wrote Silent Spring and warned us that we're poisoning the world with the exciting discoveries of the chemical industry. Some of you will remember that we used to boast about the fact that uh, we now knew, knew how to change the chemistry of things. Polymer chemistry allowed us to manufacture new chemicals, and it seemed like such a technical triumph. The consequence, unfortunately, is that we have poisoned the world at low levels. Just the way science, because we first focused on physics, which is easy compared to biology, gave us the atom before we were responsible enough to know how to contain it. So we've been using it for atomic energy for 60 years or more, and we still cannot agree on how to dispose of the wastes. And the atom bomb is out there, and it's still a threat to our future. So the conservation movement, therefore, essentially came to an end when Rachel Carson wrote that book and woke up the public to the fact that the environment matters to them. Unfortunately, the public reaction is always, at first, an emotional reaction. The young people in those days used to say, and very emotionally, this was a gut feeling, they would say, don't change the ecology. Because if you do, you threaten my future. So that was this, the public feeling in the 1960s. Now that movement only lasted 35 years or thereabouts because in 1999, there was a different awakening. The young people, the so-called flower children of the 1960s, joined forces with the unionists in Seattle and challenged the WTO the World Trade Organization, because all of a sudden there was a realization that the problems that are growing day to day are the consequence of exaggerated economic commitments. And the WTO is an organization designed on how to share the spoils of globalization. And this awakening, therefore, once again changed the parameters of understanding. So, um, 1999, things began to, to jumble. The ozone hole, for example, was an unexpected awareness of the consequences of the uses of particular kinds of chemicals, which were getting into the atmosphere and changing